the Stuxnet took us more than three months to look at. can give you a sense of how difficult, how large, and how complicated uh, the threat was. Do we know why they were asleep at the wheel here? Why did it go unresponded to? I'm here to announce the indictment of Chinese military hackers for breaking into the computer systems of the credit reporting agency Equifax. Every company you've ever heard of getting hacked, so Target, Equifax, a nuclear enrichment facility in Iran, all these companies and organizations had security teams and presumably large budgets, but they were all missing some simple security controls that ultimately resulted in them getting hacked or in the case of the enrichment facility, having their actual equipment getting destroyed. Security controls is one of the most basic topics in cybersecurity, but it's also one of the most important. So I'm gonna do my best to break it down in this video in a way that makes intuitive sense. Here's a simple way to think about security controls. Uh, basically, a security control is anything, like literally anything that helps protect confidentiality, integrity, and availability in a business. And an even simpler way to think about this, a security control is just something that protects something else, is the most basic way to think about it. So if you think about multi-factor authentication, that's a security control. Timely patch management, like updating your programs and operating systems, that's a security control. A policy that says don't take random USB devices off the street and plug them into critical infrastructure, that's also a security control. It's not really complicated. Um, if it protects something, it's considered a security control. So think about your house. You have locks on your doors, right? This is a preventative security control because it prevents random people from breaking into the house and you have a smoke detector, for example. So if, you, if there's a fire in your house, the smoke detector doesn't prevent the fire, but it detects that there may have been a fire. So it's a detective security control. And think about your ring doorbell camera or something. That doesn't like necessarily prevent anyone from coming inside, but it, it can be a detective security control, but it also can be a preventative security control because if there's a robber and they see a camera on your door, they're like less likely to try to break in. They're kind of dissuaded by the camera. So it's more of a deterrent security control. And organizations do the exact same thing, but they get like really meticulous about it. And they'll have like a matrix with all the stuff they need to protect and all the different attack vectors. So an example of, of an attack vector in your house might be like the chimney, cause someone can like get in through the chimney or the front door or something like this. So organizations will have the same thing and they'll like map out all the security controls that they're using to protect all the different ways that somebody can break in or they're supposed to be doing that anyway. And they like review it and like test the controls and everything like this. You kind of do the same thing with your house, but it's it's more intuitive and you don't have like a matrix with like the front door. Okay, we have a, a ring camera. It's just kind of intuitive for us, but we just don't call them security controls. So this kind of leads us into control categories. So people really love to categorize things in cybersecurity. So let's talk about how security controls get grouped together because you'll you'll definitely see this in job interviews as well as certification exams and it's just really important to know and understand them because if someone sees that you don't understand controls or control categories they're just gonna gonna assume you don't like understand a bunch of other stuff so you want to avoid that so there's basically um two ways basically to categorize security controls so by type and by function and we're going to talk about how to categorize them by type first so there's, there's four basic types. Uh, first type is technical controls. So these are anything technology-based. So firewalls, encryption, antivirus, access controls and software. And you can kind of think about it like if it runs on a computer, it's considered a technical security control, like firewall, for example. And then there's administrative controls. So this would be like policies, procedures, guidelines. And these are kind of like uh, soft things or, or rules that you would make that you hope people will follow that prevent bad things from happening. So like a risk management process, background check before hiring somebody. These are administrative security controls. And then there's physical security controls. This might be the most intuitive. This is basically just what it sounds like. So like locks, fences, security guards, badge readers, anything that you can physically touch that prevents you from like physically going into like a physical space. And then there's operational security controls. This is this one's a bit more difficult to understand, but it's basically stuff people do on a regular basis. So like security awareness training would fall under this category, tabletop incident response exercises. So like practicing like what you would do in the event of an incident. This is an operational security control, like an ongoing human activity. So quick gut check. Uh, what bucket does a junkyard dog roaming the perimeter fall under? Administrative controls, technical controls, physical controls, or operational controls. 
So a junkyard dog roaming the perimeter falls under physical security controls. And why is it a physical control? Um, because it's a tangible real world measure that protects a physical space. Like a junkyard dog roaming around is a physical security control that mostly acts as, as a deterrent, right? So getting into how to categorize controls by function, this way is a bit more intuitive um, for me anyway. It better defines like what the control is actually doing in a more solid way, I suppose. So in this one, there's going to be six categories. There's preventative controls. So a control that prevents, like actively prevents something from happening, like a, a firewall or like a lock on the door. And then there's a detective control that detects something that detects something may have happened. So it doesn't necessarily prevent it, but it can detect it. So like an intrusion detection system or like a, a, a smoke detector in your house. There's a corrective control. So when something bad happens, the corrective control like will immediately like, you know, correct the thing that happened. So this might be like, say in your house, you have a fire, right? A corrective control might be like an automated sprinkling system that will like dump water on the fire and like correct the incident like right away. And then a deterrent control will be, it's not like it can physically prevent something from happening but it will deter something from happening. So it might be like a way to deter hackers from breaking into a system or deter somebody from coming into your property. So like a, a junkyard dog roaming the perimeter, right? Or a ring camera or something like this, or even like a landing, like a some kind of like a notification on a website. Like this is a federal website. If you break into it, we're gonna come after you when you have unlimited budget. This is a deterrent control. And then there's recovery controls. This is a bit confusing uh, when you compare it with uh, corrective controls, but recovery control is more like long-term and, and wide scope. So a uh, corrective control might be the water like immediately dumps on the fire but the recovery control might be like a plan that you have in place to like, okay, I need to like contact the contractors to come and like fix the water damage and I need to get in touch with insurance, like blah, blah, blah. Like this plan would be a um, recovery control. And in terms of like cybersecurity and business, this might be like a business continuity plan or a disaster recovery plan, like a more like long-term kind of like plan that you have to recover from something large. And then there's compensating controls. This is probably my favorite one. This is like, it's just called like the, the next best thing control, right? So if you have like a really important facility uh, that calls for like, you know, 10 special forces operators, but they're really, really expensive and you ran out of budget, you might get 10 junkyard dogs, right? Because it's having 10 junkyard dogs is better than having nothing, right? So that's a compensating control. When you can't get the ideal thing, the next best thing is like, compensating control. Like if you don't have a, a ring camera, right, to prevent people from you know, breaking into your house or like deter them from it, you could like uh, stand outside with like a butter knife or something. Cause this is still better than nothing, right? If you're there with a butter knife, they're, they're less likely to break into your house, but you know, it's a bad control, but it's still a compensating control. So let me show you what an, an actual security control looks like in the real world, because in real jobs, you'll be kind of reading these and using this type of stuff. So what you're looking at on the screen here, uh, this is from NIST Special Publication 853, the Security and Privacy Controls Catalog. Uh, I'm gonna make a video that talks about this uh, in depth, but you can kind of think about this as a catalog that has like, quote unquote, like all of the security controls, like, you know, not all, but you know, basically all of the security controls. And you can see them, um, all the different control families here, are like the different categories of controls, like personnel security, risk assessment, etc. So we're gonna look at uh, access control. Um, this is gonna be something really familiar to everyone watching this. And then inside of here, there's individual control names. So we're gonna look at uh, what's called AC11 device lock. Um, I guarantee that everyone is familiar with this. They just don't realize it or they don't, they don't know it yet. But the way this control is defined is uh, AC11 is uh, prevent further access to a system by initiating a device lock after X time period of, of inactivity or requiring the user to initiate a device lock before leaving the system unattended and retaining the device lock uh, until the user reestablishes access by using established identification and authentication procedures. So this is like really complicated way of saying like um, after five, you know, five minutes, for example, of non-use, your device, whatever it is, will automatically lock. 
and then in order to get back into it, you have to put your name and password. That's literally all this is saying. It's just saying it in a, a really generalized way that applies to any kind of system, right? So this is a, a real life security control. And um, a lot of the time the government will, you know, for their systems, they'll pick controls out of 853, the control category. And depending on the system, they can require like certain security controls. Like, okay, we need to have like AC11, AC9, like uh, IR1, like incident response one, and they can like pick which controls are required. And again, I, I do wanna say like, you don't have to memorize like all of these controls, right? You don't have to memorize all the control families and everything. I'm sure some nerd somewhere has done this, but the idea is to know that the categories and the family and like the publication exists and that different controls exist and then different systems may require different controls. And it's good to understand like how to categorize them. So why am I telling you all this? Why are we even talking about it? Like if you want to get into cybersecurity, like your people are going to throw around the term control like a lot. It's probably probably like the most used term in cybersecurity, to be honest. Like that's a detective control. This is a corrective control, like etc. And if you don't understand what controls are, um, it's just going to be really difficult for you to follow along in those type of conversations. And more importantly, like all these big frameworks and special publications like NIST 853, like NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, the CIS controls, um, PCI DSS, DISA STIG, all of these things use controls in like some way, shape or form. And it's just really important for you to understand them, especially when you're getting into interviews. Um, it may seem like trivia, like someone might ask you something like as a, you know, L2 security analyst or L1 SOC analyst, like what is an example of a preventative security control that you might find in a SOC. They ask you something like this, and if you don't know what control is, or you don't have examples of preventative security controls and you just can't answer, it's indicative that you you probably don't know like other things. And this, this is one of those like core basic things that you should really strive to understand. This is a really good opportunity to use ChatGPT or one of the other LLMs to further solidify your understanding of security controls. Like you can say, give me an example of preventative controls give me an example of detective controls and you can have a conversation with like this until you have a really good intuition of how to categorize the different security controls. So no pressure, obviously, but if you're serious about getting into cybersecurity or you just want real non sandbox hands on experience with actual enterprise tools in a live shared network, you can get all of that in the cyber range. In the past year, we've done about 100 employment verifications. That is like real employers reaching out to us to confirm experience for people in the community that have actually landed jobs. When you onboard into the community, you'll get issued credentials for access to our company's actual network, which is a real live corporate environment with over 1200 users and fully licensed enterprise security stack with platforms like Tenable Vulnerability Management, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint and Microsoft Sentinel. And just like at a real security job, we'll provide training covering everything that you'll encounter from enterprise vulnerability management to threat hunting to general security operations as well. And you'll get experience and training better than if you were hired as a corporate junior SOC analyst. Every week, we also have a cybersecurity threat hunt and capture the flag challenge where you can compete for cash prizes while building legit resume experience at the same time. And this isn't a simulation, it's like real infrastructure with real users, real attacks and organic logs that you'll have hands on access to. So if you're interested, check out the link in the description and we'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.